Hey guys, thanks for watching. Now there's going to be multiple parts to this video, so make sure you like and subscribe to you so you can see the whole finished product. Today's video is going to be about pouring this concrete patio. Now we're going to stamp it too, and then we're also going to pour and stamp down the end of the house, which is to the left of the video here that we haven't even got formed up yet. So that's going to be coming up soon too. But right now, today's today's project is getting this poured. It's real early in the morning. It's like 6 a.m. It's really hot out today. So we got to get this thing poured quick because we know it's going to set up really fast and the concrete's going to have to be stamped. And we got to get from one end all the way to the other and around the corner of the house to the left up to the front door. Now the stamp we're using today is going to be a rock texture stamp. So luckily that's one of the easiest stamps there is to use. That'll be in part two. So make sure, you know, if you want to learn how to stamp concrete, you can come back and watch that. Plus, if you're interested in learning how to do this like we do it, I can also teach you how to do that in the concrete underground. There's a link for that below too. Now we came in, we formed this up. We used the combination of our poly metaforms and some two by fours for various reasons some of the reasons are you know we don't like cutting those poly metaforms so we'll use those in areas where we don't have to cut anything to size and then when we get a fit pieces in at a certain length we'll use two by four so we can cut them just not quite as expensive buying a two by four as it is buying the poly metaforms but we really like the poly metaforms so shout out to them I'll have a link for them down in the description too if you want to check them out. We, they, we, we like using those for rigid stuff, but they also have some really nice flexible forms too. Now we're using the pink fiberglass rebar today. You can see Eric right there. He's got the rebar puller. He's kind of pulling it up into the concrete as we go. That's 3 8 rebar, but it has the strength of number 4 half inch steel rebar. That's what it's rated as. So that stuff is rated, it can be used in commercial jobs, um, it's really lightweight. It comes in, we buy it in packs of 20, and one guy, I could lift, easily lift probably three of those, I could lift 60 bars myself and just carry them at the same time, you know, wherever I want. That's how light they are. And they come in 20 foot lengths, so they're real easy to lay out, real easy to tie together using wire ties. And we use it in a lot of our residential stuff. Now this patio, it's 12 feet wide. This section right here is about 36 feet long. And then there's a walkway that goes around the corner to the front of the house. Hey, another thing I want you, number one, I want, if you're watching this video, let me know where you're from. But also, I do videos in a couple different ways. I will, I will narrate over them like this. And then I also wear a head cam. You can see me, I'm holding the chute. Sometimes I'll add in the head cam parts to the tripod parts like this and just make it like a, like a real live video. And I wanna know which ones you guys like best. Do you like it when I narrate over them and kind of explain what we're doing like this? Or do you like actually being there like in the moment with us, getting the sound and the video from the head cam plus adding in the tripod stuff too. I've got videos I do both ways so if you watch kind of both of the types of videos let me know down in the comments below which ones you like so we got a string going on the top of those forms and Darren's just kind of eyeballing the string to get it into the center of the form to make sure the forms stay nice and straight when we form it up you know a lot of times we'll use the string to go by but we'll form it so it actually has a slight bow inwards that way when the when the weight and the force of the concrete gets poured inside the form it kind of wants to push the form out if anything a little bit and if it doesn't then we can just tap on usually tap on those stakes and get it to come right out to straight to where we need it The mix design we like to use for stamp concrete is a 4000 PSI mix. We generally use a 3-8 stone like a pea stone. We feel it stamps a little bit easier. We'll have fiber mesh in the concrete, which we do here also. we got fiber mesh and the rebar for reinforcement. And then we use a, a mid-range, usually a mid-range water reducer, which allows us to pour a fairly loose slump like you see here without affecting the strength at all. 
That and what that does, it does two things. It makes number one, it makes pouring the concrete quite a bit easier, but it allows us to get the concrete in faster too. So we get plenty of time to get the concrete poured and in place and maybe, you know, a little bit of rest in between having to come back and start stamping it. Pouring tailgating right out of the truck too makes it pretty easy. This company we're using today, the, the company with the red cabs, they don't have any front end loaders. All they have are these rear dumps. But they got some really nice trucks, so they got some brand new ones. But they don't buy any front ones, it's all rear ones. So one guy kind of has to control the chute like I'm doing. Which is what most of the companies have around our area. Not too many of the companies that we order concrete from have the front dump. So we're kind of used to pouring it out this way anyway. I do like the fact that I can control like where the chute goes, how long I hold it in place. And then I can tell the driver when I want him to move ahead. So in that in that perspective, it's kind of nice, but it does take, you know, one man, it takes myself to be able to do that versus if you get a really good driver with a front end dump, then he can kind of do that for you. So it frees me up to do other things like, you know, something like magging edges like what Darren's doing or, you know, starting a screed or something like that. So this, by the time we're done with this project, there's going to be a pretty good sized patio going all the way around the corner of this house. What the homeowner had here before was he had some, some tiles here that he installed and he just didn't like, he didn't like how the water coming off the roof affected the tiles. It was kind of blowing out the grout. Well, even though the tiles did look pretty nice, that was just kind of a pain. So they decided to take the tiles out and put in stamped concrete and you'll see in the end what this looks like Now we got poly up on the house just to try to help keep some of the splatters coming from the chute when the concrete falls out of the chute onto the ground sometimes it'll splatter a little bit and when you're raking it around like the guys are doing right now sometimes it'll splatter a little bit so that plastic will just help keep the splatters off the siding Usually after we get the concrete poured, we like to pull that poly right down and we're not too worried about any concrete getting on the side and after we pour it during the stamping process. So generally we'll rip it down and just get it out of the way. As you can see, we're pouring out a pretty big section of concrete before we screed it. This is what we like doing. This is what allows a couple things allow us to do this. Number one is the experience we have you know doing this every single day we know how much time we have to work with the concrete versus you know how much area we're pouring how hot out is uh, it is outside how fast we think the concrete's setting some you can just feel the concrete usually as you're walking in it and tell if it's starting to set up pretty quick is it kind of hot do we have a little bit of time can we pour out a little bit more so that's one thing and then how fast we can screed this thing has setting the forms right to grade kind of makes screeding it a little bit easier and then using the using the mid-range water reducer too allows us to pour out more get more down before we screed it because it really isn't going to take us very long to screed this with two guys on the screed two guys puddling you know it'll just be a matter of minutes to get it down Them stakes, they were in the ground pretty hard. This was pretty hard ground. So if the board was bowed in just a little bit, them stakes didn't want to move out very easily if you're tapping on them. The Luke's just getting the edges a little magged up a little bit. Just makes That makes screeding a little easier when your edges are nice and clean like that. That's just the way we've always done it. Up against the house, we snapped a chalk line. We used the laser level, shot some grades, snapped a chalk line up on the house. And that's what I'm going by right there as I'm magging that edge up against the house. We did put some ISO strip foam up against the house too to kind of kind of create, you know, an isolation point between the house and the slab. That way if the slab does want to move at all, it's not going to affect the house at all or vice versa.
We're trying to get Luke. Luke's kind of new, although he did work a little bit last summer. He just graduated from high school, so it, you know, he does a pretty good job. He kind of knows what he's doing. Just needs a little more experience doing it. See how we're a little bit high there, so we're getting him to pull it right back. We'd rather be a little bit high, actually, than low. It's a little bit easier to be high and then stop and pull it backwards than it is if you're low, then you got to turn around and stop pulling it back in. And it just keeps creating a low spot in the concrete, so we tried to we tend to get it as close as possible to grade, but if anything, we want to be a little bit high. So we got to pull it back like this. It just makes screeding it easier, actually. That's generally what it looks like after you screed it. It looks like, you know, a lot of aggregate at the surface. Even pouring the loosest, loosest lump we do, the aggregate doesn't really settle. It stays right intact. And then the bull float is really what's used to get you the really nice, finished, smooth looking surface. And that's all we really need to do. We don't need to consolidate the concrete anymore. We don't need to use a tamper or anything like that. We've never had to use a tamper. So now what Luke's doing is he's kick screeding over there. And all that basically is is we walk backwards as we're screeding and we kick the concrete into the spot where we just picked our foot up out of and if we can if if everybody's doing a really good job then we don't generally have to stop very much as we do this we just keep screeding until we run out of pad now the guy on the outside which is Eric the guy screeding off the board kind of he kind of tries to match the guy on the inside's screeding speed and his stroke. And that makes the guy's job on the inside screeding a lot easier. That's how they kind of work together as they do this. You don't, he, the guy on the outside really doesn't want to be ahead of the guy on the inside. He wants to be at least even or maybe just a little bit behind him, you know, a little bit of an angle behind him. And, you know... That just makes the whole process go a little bit easier for the guy on the inside. Luke's job, the guy, he, Luke's the guy on the inside screed, and his job is just to make sure that as he, as he pulls that screed back, he's scoring on the end with his rod, and all that means is he's leaving a little bit of a line. You can kind of see the line on the left-hand side, a few inches away from the board. When, if he's leaving that line, then he knows he's scoring and he's down to where he needs to be. He's not leaving a hump or making a dip or anything like that in the concrete. Now I grab the bull float and I'm going to run this bull float back and forth over the concrete. And you can see I'm just, I'm not going really fast. I'm not going too slow. Just kind of steady back and forth and as I go back and forth the bull float settles the aggregate down just below the surface and brings up that paste and that's the part we'll finish now when you when you get to the stamping video you'll see us we will mag float out the surface again before we stamp just to get a really nice surface to stamp But the guy bull floating can really make that part a lot easier if he just does a good job bull floating. That's why I'm going to kind of show you how I do this here. The bull float, we like this four foot bull float with the rounded edges too. Not Some bull floats come with just square edges. The rounded one tends to leave a lot less line on each end as you bull float. Doesn't really dig into the concrete at all. You can see as I go back and forth over the concrete, there's no, there's no uh, dips under the concrete. There's no empty spaces under the concrete. That means we've screeded that concrete nice and kind of flat. Even though the concrete slopes away from the house about an inch. When I see people bull floating and then they got to stop and go get a shovel full of concrete and shovel it under the bull float to fill in areas. You know, that's when you know you're going to start having problems with with gaps and low areas and dips and the concrete puddling when it rains. 
it should look just like that after you screed and bow float right there. Nothing, nothing you have to fill in. It should look really nice after you bow float. So that didn't take the guys very long to screed that section. Probably took them four or five minutes to get it all screeded. Probably took longer to pour it than it did to screed it, actually. And then it's going to take just about maybe a little bit less time to bow float it. You can see I'm being really careful. I'm not, I'm not picking it up right at the form, and I'm not going all the way up against the house and tipping the bow float because that leaves just a little bit of a divot. Sometimes when you do that, when you tilt that bow float back and forth, and that's something you'll have to mag out by hand afterwards. You can see I stay just a few inches away right from the very foundation. If I do leave a tiny bit of a divot when I re-tilt that bow float to bring it back, I don't want it I don't want it right up against the foundation. I want it a few inches away. Just makes it easier to fill afterwards. Now the guys are starting on the walkway now. That's four feet wide. I think that walkway was about 43 feet long total going around the corner. Now we're going to end up jointing this too. We like, you know, sometimes when we stamp, we'll either saw cut it or we'll hand cut joints. And this one I believe that we decided just to saw cut it so we can do all the finishing work. The stamping basically without cutting any joints which makes which makes the process go a little bit faster I'm gonna move the camera down here so you can get a little bit better view of what the guys are doing as I'm bow floating so definitely one place we'll put a joint is where the where the four foot walkway meets the 12 foot wide walk patio that's that's kind of a given right there you know you want to you want to joint that and then we'll in the walkway we'll end up putting them probably every four or five feet along the walkway and I think in the in the patio area we put them we cut one down the middle of the long way so that was six feet and then we I think we put them every nine feet after that the other way let me know what you guys have for questions as far as pouring here that's I mean that's a pretty good pouring slump with water reducer right there. That's, I, I don't know what that is. Maybe I'd call it around a six for a slump. So that's a pretty good workable slump. Makes life a lot easier getting the concrete poured and put it in place. And you know whether you're raking it around, whether you're screeding it, magging it, it makes just makes everything a lot easier than pouring something a lot stiffer. And you can see how the surface kind of fills in as Luke screeding it. The surface fills in pretty nicely after he screeds it, so it just makes bow floating a lot easier too. And he's just kicking the mud into where his feet are, so he can just keep moving himself backwards. Doesn't have to. Doesn't have to stop and step backwards and then screed and stop and screed and stop like a lot of guys I see screeding by themselves. I, I don't know. This is just the way we've always done it. I I can't imagine doing it any other way. It just seems like this would be the easiest way. But I suppose if you've never done it this way, then you probably think the same way I do about the way you do it is probably the easiest way. Let me know which way you do it. Do you, do you screed and kick backwards like we do, or do you just stand there, pull the screed back three or four times, stop, step backwards, and then do it over again? You can see Eric's right there to the right on the standing on the outside. He's put a couple kickers in there because the forms were bowed out just a little bit. So we use those kickers as leverage to get the boards back in straight. That walkway was just wide enough to run that bow float down where the edges didn't run on top of the forms. If the edges of the bow float run on top of the forms, it doesn't usually bow float as nice. So this worked out just perfectly. And just once down and back, I think with this was good.
So that goes to their front door right there. That's the main entrance of the house. The other entrance is just, I believe that's kind of like off their living room area. So they'll, they're going to end up putting a garage over here to the right at some point. It may even tie into the house, I'm not sure, but this will be end up being their main entrance right here. We did end up putting color in the concrete, so we used what's called a color called gull gray, and it just keeps the concrete dark. If you don't add any pigment, any gray pigment to the concrete, then the concrete, when it cures up, it cures up really, really light, kind of like the foundation on the house right there. Like you could almost say that's white or really light gray. Now, because we put the gray in the concrete, it'll keep it a, like a darker gray like it looks right now. Maybe a little bit lighter as it cures out, but after you seal the concrete, you know, once you come back and wash it, and we end up adding a secondary color in the teak wash, which if you subscribe, you'll see in the next part. Um, but after you seal it, it ends up looking darker gray like this than it does the really light white which I call white, but it's really light gray on the foundation. So that'll end up doing it for the pour. Now make sure you subscribe to see part two. I'll, I'll put that right out as the very next video. And that's going to be like us stamping this and then washing it, cleaning it, getting it to go. And then after that, if you want to learn like what we do after that, you know, you're going to have to join the Concrete Underground to learn how to stamp concrete. So I can teach you in there, you know, the basics of how to stamp concrete a lot like we do. And then that's kind of where you get started. So thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you on the next one.